The question uh, that Corwell has mentioned is, do you feel your mind is in bondage? Now, if you were asked to describe your life, what would your answer be? Fulfilling, successful, joyful, meaningful, peaceful, positive, or would you be more inclined to utilize negative words like depressing, discouraging, hopeless, boring, discontented, and the difference between the two may be related to the way you think. Maybe, just maybe, you are in bondage to a stronghold in your mind. You may find yourself unable to think in a positive way, lacking the freedom to do so because of a mental stronghold. So let's take a look at what is going on in your mind. Since the fall of man, everybody is born into this world physically alive, but spiritually dead. Having no relationship with God, we progress through those developmental years, learning how to survive without Him. And defense mechanisms are developed as we learn how to cope, relate, and hopefully succeed in life. Living a life independent of God, centering one's interest on self, is what constitutes the flesh. It becomes mental patterns of thought, a means of living without the benefits of God's presence or the wisdom of knowing God's ways. God's plan is that we be born again and then be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. If we have received Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we have experienced spiritual birth, born again. Now, although we are then new creations in Christ, our minds have previously been programmed to live without him. The flesh, that which was trained from the day we entered planet Earth all the way up to the present time, programmed into our memory banks all kinds of experiences, activities, and beliefs. But when we came to Christ, nobody pushed the clear button. Like a computer, we recorded all of those experiences, and it's there in our computer. During that time, what is called strongholds, patterns of thinking, were raised up in our minds, and they affect our temperaments, how we feel today, and how we think today. Now, whether we realize it or not, we are engaged in a battle during our time spent on planet Earth. The battlefield is the mind, and the nature of the battle is presented in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The image presented here is similar to an offensive battering ram that is designed to tear down strongholds. What are these strongholds or fortresses of the mind? And how have they been raised up against the knowledge of God? And how are they destroyed? Well, as mentioned, without God in our lives, 
we learned to live our lives independent of him. Everything we learned in the early formative years of our lives was assimilated from the environment in which we were raised. This assimilation was accomplished in two ways. First, from prevailing stimulation, and secondly, from brief or traumatic stimulation. Attitudes and beliefs were formed from long-term exposure to the homes in which we were raised, the neighborhoods which, where we played, and the schools we attended, the friends we had, and the churches we attended. All these childhood experiences shaped our worldview. Now, it's important to realize, however, that two children raised in the same environment will interpret their experiences differently. Secondly, beliefs and attitudes are also formed in our minds from traumatic experiences, such as the death of a parent, a divorce in the home, or mental, physical, or sexual abuse. Unlike prevailing experiences that are assimilated into our minds over time, these traumatic experiences are burned into our minds because of their intensity, and they will leave lasting impressions. Your environment had a deep effect on how you think. You, however, are not just the product of your environment, but as we will see later, you are also the product of how you responded to your environment, how you processed the experiences that you had in your childhood, your perception of your experiences. If you grew up separated from God, you developed a godless philosophy about life, and notwithstanding the fact that when you became a Christian and your sins were washed away, your predisposition to think and behave a certain way, which you developed as you adjusted to your environment, remained ingrained in your flesh. In fact, you can become a born-again believer and continue to live on the basis of the lifestyle you developed while you lived independent of God. That is why the Apostle Paul insists that we must be transformed by the renewing of our mind. The first thing you need to know about the battle for your mind is that it is not fought on the plane of human ingenuity or ability. You can't outsmart or outmuscle the flesh or the devil on your own. Your weapons must be divinely powerful if you are going to win a spiritual conflict. The main targets which must be destroyed are the fortresses in the mind. Some versions of the Bible use the word strongholds. As we continue our study on the renewal of our minds, we readily appreciate that what we look at, what we hear, how we process those events has a consequence and therefore we see the necessity to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The physical and emotional responses to our thoughts may be so fast that we could think that we have no control over the process, but we do. And that's where the battle is going to take place because our emotions are by and large a product of our thought life. Whenever we are confronted with something and we are considering it, what happens? It's as though two plans form in our minds. Plan A is God's way by faith, whereas plan B is man's way by reason. Faith in God is the Christian way to live, while humanistic philosophical thinking and reasoning is the human way. But God's ways and man's ways of thinking are often in conflict, and the nature of the battle for the mind is the conflict between plan A and plan B. Now, it's not that faith is unreasonable, because God is a rational God and does work through our reason. The problem is that man's ability to reason is limited. 
We are incapable of determining God's thoughts through human reasoning. Therefore, we are dependent on divine revelation. But any movement, any commitment that one makes in reference to man's way by reason has a corresponding lack of commitment to God's way by faith. The more time and energy you invest in contemplating your own plans on how to live your life, the less time and energy you have to seek God's plan. You begin flip-flopping back and forth between acknowledging God's plan and leaning on your own understanding. James calls this kind of a person double-minded. When you continue to vacillate between God's way by faith and your way by reason, your spiritual growth will be stunted, your maturity in Christ will be blocked, and your daily experience as a Christian will be marked by disillusionment, discouragement, and defeat. The essence of the battle for the mind is the conflict between God's way by faith and man's way by reason. Impulses from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now you may think that you are the helpless victim in this battle, being slapped back and forth like a hockey puck, but you are anything but helpless. If you are in Christ, God has provided all you need to win this battle for your mind. When you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior and became a born-again Christian, you brought with you into your new life of faith all the old Plan B habits and thought patterns of the flesh. So now, while your new self desires to live dependent upon God and follow God's plan, your flesh persists in suggesting man's plan, which is to live independent of God. Your flesh still generates humanistic thoughts and ideas. And secondly, we are continually being influenced by this fallen world. The mass media and the worldly environment are dominated by plan B thinking. Thirdly, the God of this world, Satan, and his demons are actively involved in trying to distract you from your walk of faith by peppering your mind with his thoughts and ideas. And he is relentless in his attempts to establish negative worldly patterns of thought into your mind, which will in turn produce negative worldly patterns of behavior. He is the father of lies, and he will attempt to accuse, deceive, and tempt God's children, just as he did Eve, if we let him. In addition, false prophets, teachers, mediums, and spiritists will also lead many astray. The essence of the battle for the mind is the conflict between God's way by faith and man's way by reason, impulses from the world, and the flesh, and the devil. Now, once your consideration of a temptation triggers an emotional response leading to man's way by reason, choice, you will act upon that choice and own that behavior. You may resent your actions or claim you are not responsible for what you do. However, you are responsible for your actions at this stage because you will have failed to take a tempting thought captive when it first appeared at the threshold of your mind. People who study human behavior tell us that if you continue to repeat an act for six weeks, you will form a habit. And if you exercise that habit long enough, a stronghold will be established. And once a stronghold of thought and response is entrenched in your mind, your ability to choose to act contrary to that pattern is very difficult. So what is a stronghold? A stronghold is a mental 
habit pattern. It is memory traces burned into our minds over time or by the intensity of traumatic experiences, states Dr. Neil Anderson, author of the book Victory of the Darkness, from which I am drawing this information. Mr. Ed Silvoso, author of the book That None Should Perish, states that a stronghold is a mindset impregnated with hopelessness that causes one to accept as unchangeable something they know is contrary to the will of God. Inferiority is a stronghold. Nobody is born inferior to anyone else. But you could be struggling with an inferiority complex if you kept getting the message from the world that everyone is stronger, smarter, and better looking than you. Hostility is a stronghold. The man or woman who struggles with hostile thoughts and behavior learned to behave that way when threatened. That is how he or she learned to cope in difficult circumstances. Anorexia or bulimia are strongholds. Eating disorders have little to do with food. A 95-pound woman standing in front of a mirror believing she is fat and can't see the deception is being influenced by a stronghold. She is the victim of a native of thought patterns about herself that have been burned into her mind over time or they could have originated during traumatic experiences such as rape or incest. A stronghold is a way of thinking that controls you. Basically, strongholds are lies that people believe and rely upon to defend and protect their right to their belief. Any knee-jerk response which directs your thinking and acting in a negative plan B way is a stronghold in the mind. The presence of a stronghold must be suspected when a Christian finds himself powerless to function according to God's word. Now, do we have to remain victims of these mental strongholds for the rest of our lives? Absolutely not. If we have learned to believe a lie, can we now choose to believe the truth? If we have programmed our computers wrong, can they be reprogrammed? Absolutely. But we, want, we have to want to renew our minds, and we have to assume our own responsibility in the process, because nobody can think for you, and nobody can take every thought captive for you. There is a battle going on for your mind, but you can win the war if you really want to. Romans 12, verse 2 states, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Our lives are transformed as we renew our minds through the hearing of God's word, Bible studies, personal discipleship, and Christ-centered counseling and prayer. Because some of these strongholds are thoughts raised up against the knowledge of God, see 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, learning to know God, learning to know God as your loving Father and yourself as His accepted child is the starting place. But as I mentioned previously, more is going on in your mind than uh, prior negative conditioning. You are not just up against the world system in which you were raised and the resultant flesh patterns you have chosen to adopt. You are also up against the devil who is scheming to fill your mind with thoughts that are opposed to God's plan for you. In addition to previous thoughts, that formed mental strongholds, we have the present day responsibility
to manage our thoughts according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Why do these thoughts need to be taken captive? Because they are contrary to God's ways and they may be the enemy's thoughts. Notice how Paul uses the word thoughts in 2 Corinthians in relation to Satan's activity. In chapter 3, verse 14, and chapter 4, verse 4, Paul reveals that Satan is behind the spiritual hardness and blindness of unbelievers. He states, But their minds were hardened. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Satan's strategy is to introduce his thoughts and ideas into your mind and deceive you into believing they are yours. If Satan can place a thought in your mind, and he can, it isn't much more of a trick for him to make you think it is your idea. And if Satan can get you to believe a lie, you can lose some element of control in your life. Satan has no authority or power over you if you are in Christ, except when you yield to him when you are deceived into believing his lies.